Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to this uh, second video in the series that I'm doing on the Minority Attack. I'm going to start uh, this video with a couple of games that were taken from the uh, famous 1929 Carlsbad tournament. Um, just to say a few words about the tournament itself, it was actually a pretty interesting uh, tournament. Um, Alexander Lechen was not participating. He was the world champion, but as a result, there were a lot of uh, potential contenders for the world championship uh, fighting uh, for a good showing in this uh, tournament. Um, we had uh, Nimzovic at the top. He won with a score of uh, 15 points in this 21-round tournament. Um, behind him were Capablanca and Spielmann with uh, 14 and a half points each, and then just behind them was uh, Rubenstein with 13 and a half points. So uh, kind of a stellar cast for this tournament and a lot of uh, interesting chess. Um, I wanted to say Spielmann in particular seemed to be in good form. Uh, he's a great attacking player and very tactical, so it's kind of fun to uh, play over his games. Uh, but anyway, this, this video is about the uh, minority attack. And uh, so the first uh, game I wanted to look at was between Samish and Maroxi. So two more players that are uh, pretty well known for their contributions to opening theory. They did reasonably well in the tournament, finishing you know more or less in the middle of the pack. Anyway, Samish with the white pieces starts off with d4. And Maroxi goes uh, e6. And after c4, knight f6, knight c3, he's not going for the Nimzo Indian defense, but he's playing d5 and just going for a queen's gambit decline. So we get a pretty normal uh, development from here. I'm going to go through the opening a little quickly uh, to get to the key points. Um, so just, uh, uh, yeah, as I said, normal development. a6 is a little bit interesting. Maybe he wants to stop the knight from coming into b5. Um, and at this point, uh, Samish decides to uh, exchange. So c takes d5, e takes d5, and at this point it starts to take on the character of an exchange variation. Uh, let's see, bishop to d3, rook e8, castles, all more normal development, and c6 showing up the center. And at this point, we've got the uh, Carlsbad structure, named after this uh, very tournament where this game was played. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Samish at this point continued with bishop to f4. This knight uh, went to f8, so that opens up a diagonal for the uh, light squared bishop. Um, you know, the one problem black has in this structure is, is the development of this bishop, and uh, um, the exchange actually helps it in a way, uh, the exchange of pawns, because it opens up that diagonal for the bishop. Um, Samish plays h3 there, taking taking some squares away from that bishop before it gets uh, too active. Um, and uh, Maroxi goes for the trade with bishop d6. I think this is a pretty common idea in this position, although um, it does weaken the dark squares, so there is some later consequence to this. But um, these exchanges of minor pieces also um, make it a little more easy, a little easier for black to develop his pieces. So that's that's all pretty normal. And then uh, knight a4 here, immediately after the exchange of the uh, dark squared bishop, he jumps this knight out here where it's uh, looking at some of these uh, dark squares. So a very logical place so far. Uh, this move here, knight to d7, that Samish, or Maroxi plays knight to d7 here. Um, it's kind of a logical move. It is um, defending these dark squares and also the, um, the e5 square where this knight, <clears throat> excuse me, this knight might be thinking of coming into uh, e5, and so this knight is protecting uh, against all of those ideas. Uh, but it's a bit of a passive move, so not bad, but maybe a, the chess engine prefers a move like knight to uh, e4. And this does allow knight to e5, but uh, it seems to be this is a, this is a game, <laughs> and uh, things get kind of interesting. I guess uh, maybe he didn't like the idea of this knight coming into b6 as well. So anyway, the game went uh, knight to d7 and should still be okay. It's just maybe not not the strongest move there. Um, so rook, uh, rook f to c1. So uh, Samish starts bringing his pieces over the queen side. Get um, g6 here, queen b3, king g7. So interesting rearrangement over here on the king side. Rook c2, preparing to double on the c file. f6, rook a to c1. Rook to e7, so maybe uh, doubling on the e-file or maybe just defending along the second rank. 
um, and night to c5. So the knight parks itself on this uh, interesting square and uh, asks black the question uh, what he intends to do about it. So black takes off the knight. And so this is another uh, interesting point. Um, white has a decision to make. Uh, white can take with the rook and keep this traditional structure with this pawn plus these two pawns. Um, you know, there's still the potential for uh, a traditional kind of minority attack as we saw in the previous video with this pawn holding back the C pawn and these two coming forward to conflict, to inflict damage. But in this particular case, after rook to C5, um, black has knight to e6. That's a good square for the knight, and it kicks the rook back. And it uh, seems like black is solid enough. It seems like this is um, okay for black. Um, so um, Roxy went the other way. I mean, uh, Samish. Samish took, the, took with the pawn instead of taking with the rook. And so we still have the potential for a minority attack here. And I just wanted to show this game in part because of this... Uh, choice, this uh, transformation of the pawn structure, it's still three pawns against four. So we've just got slightly different uh, different uh, arrangement or alignment of the pawns. We've got the three pawns on the A, B, and C files, and uh, then the four pawns, as always, on A, B, C, and D. So uh, let's continue. Queen to C7 was played. Now queen to C3, piling up <laughs> behind the C pawn, but, you know, getting out of the way of the uh, of the uh, A and B pawns. Um, let's see, knight to D7. And uh, as soon as that knight goes to D7, since it went to D7 instead of uh, E6, this knight is free to come to the D4 square. And once again, we see it's another consequence of the, uh, of the dark squared bishop being traded. There's no piece that can uh, challenge that knight except for the other knight. And so that would take some maneuvering to get that knight back into place where it can challenge it. And notice that there's no pawns that can chase that knight away. So it's got really an ideal outpost there. But, uh, well, black gets an outpost for his knight as well, knight to e5. Um, the bishop drops back to f1. It's not interested in trading off that bishop. Um, and then h5. So uh, black is looking for activity on the king's side to compensate for what... Uh, uh, to give some counterplay for what white is doing on the queen side. Uh, let's see, this rook goes to uh, e1, the knight goes back to f7, and then b4. So now the minority attack uh, gets rolling. We have uh, bishop to d7, defending, and uh, a4, knight to g5, and rook to b1. So the rook goes back to uh, to help out with the minority attack. Notice that the knight, the bishop, and the rook are all uh, coordinating on that uh, b5 square, so there's no way that uh, black can stop uh, white from pushing on with b5 at this point. But uh, the knight does get to e4, which is a pretty nice square. Uh, the queen drops back to b2. Uh, let's see, the king goes to f7, maybe defending this rook in some cases. I'm not quite sure. Uh, let's see, bishop to d3. Rook A to E8, doubling on the E file, and Queen to C1. So yeah, a lot of maneuvering. King goes back to G7. Those uh, rooks safely defended, and now White pushes on with B5. So just a, a spell of maneuvering, and then uh, the Samish decides it's time to take the plunge here. Um, black takes, White takes, and Black takes again. So this leaves uh, black with uh, some weak pawns, which are exploited immediately. Uh, but if um, black doesn't take, the chess engine is suggesting maybe the best alternative would be to play rook to c8. But uh, well, this is not so attractive either um, because of this exchange. You take and then you double the rooks on the b file and the rooks are coming in this way. So another Another thing that happens with a minority attack is those open lines. If you've set up your pieces correctly behind the pawns, you can sometimes uh, invade immediately. So um, C takes B5 is maybe not, not a move that Black was thrilled to play, but it seems uh, that there was no better alternative. Um, so Bishop takes, Bishop takes, Rook takes. And now the king went to uh, H7. And the pawn goes on to c6. And actually, uh, this pretty much uh, ends the game here because, uh, well, the game goes on for a long time. I'm, but uh, 
after this uh, takes knight takes let's see the rick goes over to g7 and um, and white takes that pawn and so that's what's happened is that uh, the uh, the weakness was left behind i suppose black could have tried to uh, hold on to defend but this annoying knight here prevents a rook from coming to that square to defend the other rook could have tried to defend for a while but um, but with this pawn being isolated i don't think it's going to hold out for long in any case so uh so uh, uh Maroxy went for a counterplay on the king side and Samish went ahead and grabbed the pawn. So at this point, he's a pawn up, and uh, we're on move 37. This game lasted for 104 moves, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I'll give you a pointer to the game if you want to uh, check it out to see how it finished up. But uh, but White did go on to win that game. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the next game. This game was also played at uh, Carlsbad in 1929 with the white pieces we have Carl Gilg and with the black pieces Hermanus Madisons. So white starts off with d4 and after a knight f6, uh, knight f3, e6, and c4. So we've transposed into a normal d4, c4 type opening. And uh, here black plays uh, bishop b4 check, the Bogo Indian. So white blocks bishop d2, queen e7, defending the bishop a3, kicking the bishop and making it decide what to do. Queen takes black castles. White brings a knight out and uh, black strikes in the center with d5. So it seems like this is um, okay play. Um, white just protects the c pawn with e3. Get knight bd7. And now at this point, uh, white decides to go for the exchange. So c takes d5, e takes d5. And after a few more moves, yeah. Bishop d3 and c6. We get the familiar Carlsbad structure again. So it's uh, white's turn here and uh, white castles. And black goes knight e4. So a good spot for that knight. Um, and hitting the queen. So the queen goes to c2. Also maybe setting up some threats along the diagonal. Rook to e8, uh, defending the knight. And now b4, white gets started on the minority attack. So at this point, uh, black decides to um, give up that knight and trade it off for this uh, knight on the queen side. Um, you know, this queen side knight, it has some ideas of coming in to the dark squares as we saw in the previous game. So maybe it's not such a bad idea to just uh, get rid of it. Um, there was no opportunity, by the way, to snag a pawn on h7 because uh, after the king moves, the bishop has to retreat and then the knight can uh, the knight can retreat as well. So. Um, there's not a problem there. Um, there is maybe an idea of uh, grabbing the knight and sacrificing the bishop over here for two pawns, but I don't think it works on this case. But in any case, yeah, white decide just to, just to grab the knight. And now uh, black plays knight f8. So this is the first move that chess engine uh, doesn't, doesn't care for too much. Um, thinks that uh, knight to f6 would be a more logical development. And the game would probably continue about the same. Um, white is going to play uh, b5 anyway, and we'd get get this kind of position, similar to what happened in the game, but with the knight on uh, on f6 instead of on f8. Um, just a little more active position for the knight, I guess. But, um, well, Hermanus, uh, yeah, uh, I guess that's his first name, Hermanus Madison's. Uh, he, he had different ideas. So he had, um, and, and this knight comes in handy, you'll see in the game. Um, so white pushes on with b5, c takes b5, bishop takes b5. And so yet again, we have a different kind of pawn structure that came out of the uh, minority attack. Other times we had white taking here and a black pawn being left on c6. Um, so this, uh, I think this structure is okay for black, but there's still um, some ideas of uh, pushing the a pawn forward, maybe creating another weakness over here, and it did leave the uh, d-pawn isolated, so there's still uh, some mileage to be gotten out of this uh, minority attack here. Um, but there's no immediate uh, danger on this diagonal. Black can just block here. In fact, we, we get a lot of exchanges after a bit. Um, well, it starts with the bishop exchange, and then uh, black even offers the queen exchange. So this is uh, first, the first point of making use of that knight there, uh, defending the queen. 
Uh, white declines the exchange and just defends. So now white offers an exchange. So I guess uh, both sides are saying they're willing to exchange queens, but only on their own terms. If, uh, if white takes the black queen, then that develops the knight. And if black takes the white queen, then that develops the rook. So, so neither side is <laughs> trading at this point. So b6, uh, just uh, moving the pawn. And, uh, you know, it's well, it needed to be defended, and he didn't want to put a rook behind it. But now the a pawn has something to bite on uh, for later in the game. Um, let's see. After b6, uh, knight to e5 was played, kicking the queen. So the queen decides, has to move now. It decides it really doesn't want to trade. It goes to d6. And now white pushes on with uh, a4. So black decides to uh, push this knight back with f6. Um, There's another point where the chess engine prefers uh, knight to g6. Although after this knight just drops back to d3, it's not clear that uh, this knight has a whole lot to do. It's looking at these uh, dark squares over here that are under white's control. Maybe it has to route around like this if it wants to come back and participate in the queen side. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, black here decided to kick the knight with a pawn, which leaves him free to uh, bring the game, the knight into the game via e6. So that was his idea here. And now this knight hops over to the queen side, and this knight goes back to c7, kicking the queen. And the queen comes into c6, offering the queen trade yet again. And this time, um, black takes white up on the trade. Um, I guess with the idea that the knight is not really stable here, it's going to uh, going to have to move again, so it's not really helping helping in the development so much to bring that knight to the c6 square. So king to f7, um, rook f to c1, king to e6. So the king is getting to a central location and defending the uh, the weakness in black's position. That pawn on uh, that pawn on d5, and now the knight hops back to b4 unleashing a discovered attack on this knight. Actually, right here at this point, the chess, en the chess engine suggests this is a good time to continue with the uh, minority attack and push on with a5. Um, so this is kind of interesting here. After b takes a5, it doesn't take back right away, but rather it activates the rook. So um, there's another idea with uh, pushing pawns forward is that they can open up lines for your pieces. So rook to b7 hitting the knight knight to a6, and rook to a1. So it looks like uh, white will be able to round up a pawn anyway, and in the meantime he's got very active pieces here, and the remaining pawn on the queen side will be pretty weak, as will the uh, the d pawn. So that looks like a good line for white. Um, another thing black could try here is avoiding the trade and pushing forward, but um, well that gives up uh, some of these squares here. Uh, for example, the uh, the uh, c5 square is now available for a rook to put pressure here. Um, but immediately, uh, white would go to b4, attacking the pawn. Well, that's defended and attacking the knight. And after the rook comes over, this, this rook can activate with rook c6 check. And this also looks uh, very good for white. So it seems like um, in this particular position, pushing the pawn forward with a4, just continuing the minority attack, uh, is the thing to do. But uh, well, something different happens in this game, which I thought was interesting. So this knight goes back to b4. Um, the king goes to d7 now to protect the knight. Um, this king starts coming over to get into the game. Uh, rook comes up to e6. Um, rook to c2. Preparing to double on the c file. And now at this point, uh, black decides to push a pawn forward, playing a5, kicking this knight back. Um, the knight doesn't move immediately. First, rook b to c1 is played. Um, let's see, black defends the knight, and then now the knight moves. So we can uh, pause and look at this situation as a further evolution of the minority attack. We have a situation where we have one pawn holding back two pawns, which can be uh, something nice for the endgame. That can be a, 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 an asset that black or white, white takes in the endgame. Um, although it's not quite as good as it would be if these pawns were... The pawns were on um, b7 and a6, and this was on uh, b or uh, a5. That would be even stronger. In this case, the idea is that, um, say, all the pieces are gone and the kings are out of the picture, maybe over on the other side of the board, um, that uh, this pawn holding back two pawns gives white an effective minor majority over here, uh, because if this pawn comes forward, white will take. But when they're this far, far forward, 
actually uh, this pawn can queen. <laughs> now white will queen first because after this pawn comes forward and this pawn takes it's black's move and then it's white's move. So so white is one step closer. White will queen, but uh, black will queen immediately afterwards. So so both sides should get queen. So it's not as strong an advantage as it would be if these were uh, one row back. Then uh, then this uh, this push of the b pawn would be out of the question. So, um, but still, it's some kind of asset that this is a, a weak and a backwards pawn that uh, the white can pile up on. Anyway, I'm going to follow the game for a little bit longer. I don't want to take it to the bitter end, but um, let's see. Uh, black continues with uh, rook to b7. White goes rook b1. So there's a little bit of shuffling. Knight a6. You're looking to get the knight into the b4 square, which would be nice, but uh, this knight is guarding that. Um, so rook to... Um, <clears throat> rook to b5 was played, and uh, now rook to d6, it was hitting this pawn, so black defended it with the rook, and now knight to c5. A couple, couple little tricks here, uh, taking advantage of the pin and forking those two pieces, so, uh, so black pretty much has to take with the knight. And now, actually, the strongest move would be uh, pawn takes c5. Um, it hits this rook, and it doesn't actually win a pawn because... Uh, Rook to c6 can um, hold that pawn back for a moment, um, exploiting the pin this way. Rook c to b2, king to c7 coming over to defend. And now uh, white can grab a pawn here. Um, and uh, black can actually get the pawn back, but black is left with a couple of pawn weaknesses. And it looks like um, an interesting end game for white. The chess engine likes that for, uh, for white. Uh, anyway, white played rook c to uh, rook c takes c5, uh, getting getting this uh, funny setup here once again. If the uh, pawn is taken, well, it's a little different this time. If the pawn is if the rook is taken, the idea here is to take with check, and the king moves out of the way, attacking the the rook. The rook can take here, so black can actually uh, get a pawn over here, but uh, white can roll up the uh, queen side. Something similar to this happens in the game where, where white sort of gives up on his queen side attack and goes over to the king side and mops up over here. Uh, kind of an interesting switch. Um, so let's back up to the game. Um, he didn't take the pawn. What he did was he played, um, let's see, yeah, yeah rook, to, uh, rook to c7, confronting the rook there. So um, uh, white just takes the pawn, rook takes d5 and uh, is a pawn up for the moment. Uh, but this rook gets active. Rook to c1 check, king e2. Um, and there's this exchange. Uh, the king goes to c6, hitting the rook. And the rook, instead of coming back here, kind of passively defending, it goes uh, active. It goes down to d8. And then, um, let's see, rook to c2, chasing the king. And this rook goes over to a2. And now this uh, this pawn can come forward, helped helped by the rook. D5 check. The king goes to c7, hitting the rook. The rook goes over here to g8. Uh, let's see. Black grabs this pawn. So now black has this majority over here that's uh, unstoppable. Connected pawns that are going to queen. And uh, but uh, white also has pawns over here on the uh, on the king side. A big majority on the king side. And um, actually, this game went on for a long time. Although white eventually won it, but both sides managed to get queen, so not the most uh, convincing ending, but uh, it shows another idea. Sometimes you can just uh, switch your focus from one side to the other um, and get try and get an advantage that way. Um, okay, so that's it for this game. Let's check out the next one. The next game shows an example of the uh, minority attack when black plays the minority attack. And I want to uh, thank one of my viewers for the suggestion. He pointed out that um, in the exchange variation of the Karo Khan, uh, black often gets the Carlsbad structure uh, with the colors reversed. So uh, black has the possibility of playing a minority attack. And I found a couple nice examples of that. So thanks for the suggestion. Uh, this game was played in Tallinn in Estonia in uh, 1987 with the black pieces we have Julian Hodgson, famous English uh, grandmaster, and his opponent is Hilar Karner. So Hilar starts off with e4 and Julian plays c6, the Karakhan. 
uh, D4, D5, we get the, uh, the main line here. But now uh, Hiller chooses to go for the exchange variation. So he takes, Julian takes back, and bishop to d3. And this is um, maybe not the most popular move here. Uh, I think the uh, main move here is knight to c3. But bishop to d3 is uh, a solid second choice and an interesting way to play. Uh, white is just going to set up with a solid center and go for a kingside attack. And the difference is uh, if the knight comes out first, then it's blocking the c-pawn, so we won't we won't get that uh, pawn structure, uh, the Carlsbad structure. So, um, but we'll see it showing up in this game. So bishop to d3, uh, knight to c6, c3. So uh, white's just setting up this very solid center formation, and uh, and his pieces will be free to attack on the king side. Uh, or at least that's the theory. <laughs> knight to f6, bishop to f4. Yeah, taking advantage of that open uh, line that the bishop has and getting it out into the game. Bishop to g4, poking the queen, and the queen pops out to b3. So we'll see an interesting idea here in a few more moves uh, where white is actually attempting to slow down the minority attack. At least that's what it looks like. Let's see. Black continues with queen d7, knight d2, and e6. So now we see the, uh, the Carlsbad structure, these three pawns against these three pawns, and we have the minority of these three pawns uh, potentially advancing against, against these. So um, let's just uh, continue on for a few moves. Um, Julian goes for the exchange here after the knight comes out. It doesn't, um, it doesn't mess up. Uh, White's pawn structure or anything, but that exchange does kind of get rid of a problem piece. So he's left with a with a good bishop, and he doesn't have to worry about his his bishop being uh, a weaker piece because it's blocked in by all those light squared pawns. So it was just a, a strategic decision to trade off that bishop. Now he uh, brings the other bishop out, allows that to be traded off, and both sides castle. And a4. That's that's the move I wanted to point out. The next move I wanted to point out anyway. Uh, this is often a good idea uh, for the side that wants to um, forestall a minority attack. Um, notice that uh, it keeps the b-pawn back. So the b-pawn is still here defending the c-pawn, which is the one pawn that's on the uh, half-open file. And so that's the, the weakness in the position. And so you keep the b-pawn back on b2, defending it. But you can push the a-pawn forward. It's not easily attacked from the front. It has to be attacked uh, diagonally or from the side, and um, or, or via knight or something, and uh, just kind of clamp down on this, um, look at where uh, three pieces are focused on the b5 square, so this uh, it's very difficult at the moment for black to get any kind of minority attack going. But as we saw in other games, the, the minority attack idea can sit in the position for a long time and then uh, show up later, and we'll see that happening in this game. Um, so anyway, black continues, uh, rook to e8. Let's just uh, go forward some moves. There's some trading here. Um, oh, the, uh, no, this is kind of interesting. Um, Julian is actually avoiding the trades here uh, by bringing the knight to f8. And then, um, let's see, this rook went back to f1, then playing f6. You know, in this position, if we back up two moves, um, I often move the knight out of the way and then push f6 immediately to chase this knight away. But uh, Julian wants to keep this knight on the board, and so he moves that knight to f8 first, and then he plays f6. So an interesting move order sequence. And we'll see this knight on f8 actually has a, another role as well. Uh, White doesn't really want to take the knight on c6. That would just open up the b file. Uh, it would hit the queen, although that's the queen can move away, so it's not a big deal at the moment. But uh, I think the main problem is it opens up the b-file on this backwards pawn, and it gives white or it gives black a c-pawn that uh, could potentially, you know, this pawn comes here and then goes forward and can be used to weaken the center. So, uh, so the knight just retreats. It goes to g4. But uh, well, white still has ideas of uh, doing something on the king side. Uh, let's see. Uh, Julian plays a6, and the queen drops back to c2. So uh, a little bit of pressure is taken off of the uh, of the b5 square, and uh, Julian pushes on with b5 immediately. So the uh, the minority attack has started up again. And notice that uh, this queen c2 move 
it sets up a battery looking at the uh, h7 square, but the knight on f8 is already defending that. So it looks like that was pretty uh, nicely calculated by Julian. Um, so a takes b5, a takes b5, rook to a6. So uh, white got an open a file for his rook, and he starts to uh, take advantage of it. Uh, black unpins immediately. Let's see, the queen now goes over to the king's side. And the minority attack continues with the b4. And white just ignores that and plays queen to g3. And this comes with a threat. Uh, the knight is immediately threatening to take on uh, f6, taking advantage of the pin. So the king steps aside to h8. And now queen to h4, logically continuing the attack. Um, the funny thing is, up to this point, the chess center has been giving white an advantage. So although uh, black's play has been, I think, very logical and consistent, it still has not been enough to uh, overcome that opening advantage that white has. Uh, white's been defending well. But right here, uh, the chess engine is recommending bringing the knight back to uh, e3. And I'm not entirely sure what this is about. Is it uh, about uh, being in a better position to defend the queen side over here? Um, but anyway, it's, it's, uh, there must be some attacking ideas too because it still gives uh, white an advantage after this point. After queen h4, it started, it breaks the game as about even. Um, so kind of a, a, minor, a minor misstep of some kind. Um, maybe it's because of this move, f5. Um, that's a nice move from black. It does, it does leave a weakness here, which we'll see uh, white trying to take advantage of. But it, it really shuts down all the activity on the, uh, on the king side. So it, so it basically eliminates uh, white's attack. I guess that's the, the point. This queen h4 move uh, wasn't so much a bad move as it just turned out to be uh, uh, a useless move. It didn't, didn't add anything to the position because uh, black can shut down the attack with this f5 move. Then, in fact, it's a tempo on the knights. The knight has to drop back to e3 anyway. Then, um, so black continues with a minority attack, the typical exchange on c3, and plays uh, rook to b3. So black gets to activate his rook on the third rank as well. And now um, knight to d1. And after this, as the second kind of slight mistake, perhaps. Um, and... Uh, and uh, uh, black is actually better in this position. And there's a particular tactic here. So if you want to uh, see if you can spot the uh, tactic, uh, you, here's your first chance. See if, you can, see, can, see if you can find a tactical idea right here for black. Okay, uh, pause the video if you want time to think about it. I'm giving the answer away now. So the, uh, the tricky move here is knight to b4. So it's, it's a fork. The, uh, the bishop is loose. The knight is loose. I mean, the rook is loose. The bishop is loose. The rook is loose. And they can't, uh, well, the rook can't come back and defend the bishop. The rook can move away and, and, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, white will lose a whole piece. Or if the bishop moves back, then white will lose the exchange by knight takes rook. So basically, pawn takes knight is forced. And then uh, black can grab that rook. So um, it leaves this uh, very funny looking pawn structure from white and uh, just all these uh, weaknesses for, uh, for black to attack. So it leaves black in an excellent position. Um, there is one uh, kind of interesting defense. I said the position was really about equal. And uh, there is a, a uh, move that defends here. Instead of knight d1, back up, instead of knight d1, queen to e1. You know, this pawn was under attack, so it needed to be defended. And it uh, wasn't, wasn't obvious to me why this, uh, this worked, but um, it has to do with the weakness of the uh, e-pawn here, the pawn on e6. So now knight b4, you can still play this, this little trick here. Pawn takes, rook takes. But after this, <laughs> you have uh, knight takes f5. So uh, it's, uh, it's actually a pin. This is a loose loose rook here. So this is okay for white. This actually turns out to be about even when the complications settle down. But uh, well, if uh, white has to um, find tactical ideas like that to stay even, I, I think it just shows in a way, uh, even if uh, the side playing the minority attack, even if they aren't technically better, somehow uh, it seems their position is uh, easier to play a lot of times. Okay, so the game went knight d1. That was what was played, knight b4, 
uh, white took and black took the bishop and now the queen comes back to f2 it it's really can't do anything more against the king everything is uh, secure over here plus the supporting pieces in the attack have been eliminated and the uh, this pawn needed to be defended and now um, black makes a move that's maybe not the most precise so the uh, the maybe the best continuation here is queen bc just queen b7 just kicking this uh, rook here on a6 the rook drops back to defend the pawn and then uh, rook to c8 putting a rook on the open file and it looks like this is a pretty pretty big edge for black uh, julian played queen c4 i think this is also um, a good move just not quite as strong let's see uh, rook to b6 it gives uh, this rook some more options it can defend the pawn from in front and it can still keep some pressure against uh, e6 so that's why uh, there's a little bit of counterplay for white here um, rook to b3 piling up on this pawn Knight to b2, kicking the queen. The queen drops back to c7. Now, now taking a look at this rook, um, and the rook runs to a6. So uh, it's interesting here. Now that uh, that uh, black has chased chased the rook away, this this pawn is just hanging, and in fact, uh, black could take it, but Julian elects not to. And it's not the best move here. Um, I think it's kind of an interesting point. If you take uh, what this does is it allows white to uh, activate his pieces a little bit. So knight to d3, kicking the rook. So the rook goes back to b6. Sorry, rook goes to b6. That was the recommended move here. Rook takes, queen takes, and knight to c5. And this knight gets a really excellent post here on c5. And there's ideas of uh, piling up on e6. So there is some counterplay for white in that position and it's not uh, such a clear win for black so um, it's interesting Julian I guess notices all of that and decides to just uh, improve his position a little bit before grabbing that pawn this knight here which was doing a good job of defending h7 is no longer needed there um, it is defending e6 but that's defended by the rook and maybe the knight can get into the game and maybe this pawn can be rounded up more conveniently um, let's see the F rook goes to a1, white doubles on the a file looking for counterplay, and then this knight goes to f6. So looks like it has some good squares here to look at. Maybe uh, uh, black is starting to think about getting some kind of attack going with the uh, control over the c file and this advanced rook. Um, so white kind of forces the issue with b5. If uh, this pawn gets too far, it'll become a menace. So Julian takes it off at this point. Um, now knight to d3, the same idea, I guess, of coming into c5 or perhaps um, also e5. Um, and knight to e4. So this knight pipes into a great central location with a tempo on the queen. Queen runs over here to a2, tripling on the a file. And now uh, black's queen invades and uh, hits the loose knight here. Um, let's see. White throws in... Uh, a tempo move here with rook takes e6 and um, let's see what's the idea here if you take the rook then uh, yeah I think the the mate on the back rank is a problem so so he's taking advantage of the uh, back rank weakness that black has here so the rook just steps aside to b8 um, now this rook comes to d1 defending the knight the knight was hanging but uh, the mate threat was more severe um, but the queen can take the pawn here. Queen takes d4, check. And let's see, this knight runs back to f2, blocking the check. Queen steps aside to c5. Sorry. The queen steps back a little bit to c5. The um, rook to uh, the rook is played to e5, ganging up on the pawns here. But uh, now Julian plays knight to c3. Maybe maybe uh, White was getting into a little bit of time trouble at this point. This was move 40. And uh, anyway, at this point, White decided to resign. So an interesting game shows how the uh, minority attack can linger in the position and then uh, get rolling. And also, once again, the, the result is not necessarily the pawn weakness, although that helps. You know, you do round up the pawn a lot of times, but also the way that Black was able to uh, activate his pieces over here 
and uh, get them into the game more effectively than white could. Okay, uh, let's. I have one more game I wanted to show you. Let's uh, let's take a look at that. This last game was played in uh, Beale in 2010, and with the white pieces we have the British Grandmaster David Howell, and with the black pieces we have uh, American Grandmaster Wesley So, one of the top players in the world. Let's see. So Howell plays e4, and Wesley goes for uh, c6, the Karo Khan, and we get the uh, same line. So we get the exact same uh, pawn formation here, bishop d3, allowing the move c3, knight c6, c3. So we see the beginning of that setup, and um, probably following the other game exactly, <laughs> move for move, I guess is a common, a common continuation at this point. Queen to b3, queen to c8. This is a little different. And the other game, queen to d7 was played, but um, we still get the same uh, structure here after knight d2, e6. So we have this uh, Carlsbad structure with the uh, with the colors reversed. Um, so black continues with knight f3. I mean, white continues with knight f3. Black goes uh, bishop e7. He's not tempted to take right away like we saw um, Julian Hodgson doing. Um, just waiting for white to uh, to uh, continue. Uh, the normal the normal moves here for white are castling, pretty typical, and knight to e5. But uh, Howell played something really weird here. He played king to f1, and in the kibitzing for this game, they were speculating that maybe he picked up his king and he dropped it before it reached uh, reached g1, <laughs> and uh, because of the touch move rule had to live with it. But I think more likely is that uh, he had researched this and decided to go for a different idea, just trying to uh, get Wesley uh, out of book. So, uh, and, and looking at this with the chess engine, it seems like uh, it's an okay move for white. It's not like uh, white is uh, better, so I guess white is giving up the opening advantage, but gets an even position where there's some different ideas, and basically wants to keep his rook on the h-file and push this pawn forward and just go for an attack. Um, you know, in this structure, it's pretty unlikely that black will castle to the queen side. So pretty good odds the king will end up over here on the king side. So anyway, uh, Wesley reacts with uh, bishop to h5. Um, let's see, rook, rook to e1, bring this rook to the center. And now a6, just uh, getting ready to start the minority attack. And right here, um, a4 could be played to, uh, as we saw in the previous game, to uh, stop the attack. Another idea at this point, which the uh, chess engine likes, let's see I jumped ahead there, is actually to play king g1. Uh, I'm not sure what king g1 is about, but anyway, allowing the minority attack and then going h4. So just getting the king uh, uh, one more step to the side, but then pushing the h pawn forward and, and starting to uh, uh, proceed with that king side attack. So that that's an idea. What uh, what Howell played here was queen to c2, so just uh, lining up on the king's side immediately, and uh, well, Wesley can proceed with b5, and Howell blocks it with b4. So this is another way you can uh, block the uh, uh, minority attack or try to slow it down, but it is a uh, it does leave a potential weakness here on c3, so that's something you always have to be aware of. Also, in a case like this, you also have to look out for tactics like uh, knight takes pawn. In this case, it doesn't work because the queen's protected, but if the queen were, were loose there, that would be a tactic here. Um, so somehow this uh, this b4 move, I think, is not as effective at slowing down the uh, minority attack as, as maybe the a4 move. But anyway, that's what was played, and it does slow it down for a bit. So game continues. Uh, it's bishop drops back to g6, trying to neutralize the pressure on this diagonal. So we get this trade which uh, has opened up the h-file. That's uh, something that uh, white has to look forward to, maybe pushing this pawn forward um, and, uh, and opening up the h-file all the way. Um, let's see. But Wesley is taking his time castling. <laughs> let's, the queen goes to d3 here. a5. He just continues with the minority attack. a3 defending. So we get this exchange. And now the a-file has been opened. And it seems like since white hasn't castled, it's actually easier for uh, for black. Yeah, it's well, black hasn't castled either. So maybe it's not because of lack of castling, but um, 
it's, it's not so easy for white to oppose the rook there because the king is in the way and the, the two rooks aren't connected is the, what I was trying to say. Uh, let's see, Wesley continues the queen b7. The knight hops into b3. And it's got a couple of interesting ideas from b3. It can come to this square or uh, it actually comes to uh, a5 later in the game. Uh, and now Wesley castles, so his rooks are connected. And he's judged that the uh, potential for an h-file attack is not too great. But, uh, well, uh, Howell's <laughs> in for a penny, in for a pound. He sees that Wesley is castled and decides to just go for this attack. So he plays h4. Um, so knight to e4, nicely blocking up things in the center. Um, knight f to d2. So this knight uh, drops back, maybe threatening to trade this uh, knight off uh, at the right moment. The rook goes to um, a3. So that slows down that idea. Pressure of the rook on this knight means that uh, taking here is less likely. Rook to b1, defending that knight. Uh, and now rook f to a8, doubling the rooks. And now the king walks over to g1. Yeah, I guess uh, there are moves that go with check, like knight here with check. Uh, so the king is getting away from those kind of tactics. Maybe that's why the chess engine liked king g1 and its variation earlier, too. Um, anyway, um, knight to uh, d8 was played here. Um, just uh, rearranging his knight, I guess. Um, rook to h3. Lifting the rook. And um, it's not, I'm not sure if the, he can actually get something going on the, uh, on the h file. He needs to get the king out of the way to bring the, uh, the other rook over. And it seems to be tied up over here on the queen side a little bit. But uh, what's he going to do? Anyway, queen to c6, and now knight to a5. So this is an interesting move. It comes with a tempo on the queen, and, um, and it uh, interrupts the communication between white's pieces. So uh, it's a pretty, pretty interesting move. Um, and you might think uh, it's giving up the c-pawn, but actually queen takes c3 is not so great. Um, what white can do here is drop the queen back to f1, and now this is really complicated. Um, there's a rook here skewering the queen, and this rook here is undefended because of the knight. Um, and so there's some long, complicated line here that the chess engine gives, uh, which leaves white slightly better. Um, and, uh, but anyway, Wesley decided not to go for all of those complications, and it seems like the correct decision so, um, but if you're not going to take that pawn, what are you going to do in this position? Why don't you uh, think about it and see if you can figure out what black's best move is here. Okay, uh, pause the video if you want time to think. I'm going to give the answer away now. The best move here is rook takes a5, just sacrificing the exchange. That, that knight there was too annoying a piece. And if we follow this on for a little bit, we also see that in addition to uh, freeing up and connecting all of Black's pieces, um, well, oh, we took with the knight, sorry. Took with the knight. He gets some pawns, and, um, and he manages to get his knight to a, a good square, too. So rook to, rook to b3 was played here. Uh, the rook drops back to a1 with check. And um, let's see, knight to b1 was played to block the check, and now b4. So, you know, maybe it calculated this far ahead and noticed, well, this is this is a weak pawn, and this knight has got a great square, and this knight is pinned along the back rank, so that's probably enough compensation for the exchange. And notice the bishop lurking back here on e7 is supporting the pawn on, um, on b4. So uh, pretty neat. Arrangement of his pieces over here by Wesley. Um, uh, Powell, Howell continues with uh, bishop to d2, maybe hoping to trade off that knight. And the knight uh, hops into a2. And at this point, um, uh, Howell makes a blunder here. He plays rook to uh, e3. But it was already getting uh, a little difficult to find uh, a good move here. We're on move 29, and he might have been low on time as well. But... Uh, so there is a, uh, a tactical move that, uh, that Black can play here. Um, so if you want to look, this, I guess, would be your last chance in this video to find, find a tactic. 
uh, what should black play here. Okay, uh, the answer, I'm giving the answer away now. So the uh, answer is knight to c1, forking those two pieces. And, and I will uh, go into that in a minute. I just wanted to point out that instead of rook e3, um, the move like rook b2 actually uh, continues the game. Um, and it's complicated from there. It seems like uh, black still has some edge, but uh, it's not entirely clear. Uh, so just a just a really messy position, but uh, but the move that uh, Howell played here after uh, knight a2 he went uh, rook to e3, and that's actually a mistake because of knight to c1. So this is a fork, and if if white just moves the queen, black will uh, get the exchange back and also be uh, pawns up. He'll have this passed pawn, and this this pawn can be rounded up. So um, uh, black needs to take that knight off and try and stay up the exchange at least. But now the queen comes in with a check. And so that's the key idea is that after after that exchange, the uh, the queen is coming in. Now the knight is defended, so it's not the winning material immediately. It's just that there's a sort of a paralysis of, uh, of uh, white's pieces trying to defend against all these threats. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the knight can't really move. It opens up the back rank. Uh, the rook and the queen are needed to defend the knight, and uh, and this knight doesn't have much too useful to do. Let's see. Um, so Wesley just uh, calmly plays knight to c6. He's going to, uh, you know, just bring this knight into the game, and that's going to be decisive. Probably already a threat of knight takes uh, here because of uh, if queen takes, then this guy is lost. Um, I don't know, but anyway, uh, I'll play g3, and uh, Wesley played knight takes. A5, maybe even simpler, and uh, and Hal resigned at this point. So uh, yeah, oh yeah, that it is simply this this uh, rook here has nowhere to go. <laughs> it needs to stay in touch with the knight, and uh, and the pawn is covering those squares, and the queen is covering that square, and there's no good counter threats. So that's how the game ended. Anyway, interesting game. Hope you guys enjoyed it. That's it for this video as well. Um, in the next one, I'm going to do one more video on the, the uh, minority attack, and the, next, uh, the focus of the next one is going to be on uh, defenses against the minority attack. So I will see you then.